Welcome uh, to everybody who's joined the session today. And we are going to be, as you can see from the agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about the national position with COVID-19 and the Hampshire position. Then Paula Anderson is going to go on to talk about how we're doing in Southern Health. Heather's going to then give you an update on the COVID vaccine. And Paula's going to talk you through where we are with staff testing. There'll then be an opportunity for you to answer, ask some questions. And Paul Draycott's going to chair a Q&A session. And then I'm going to close the session, which is going to be about half an hour in, in, in total. And the whole point of these sessions is um, to be helpful to you, to help to keep you up to date with the very um, latest information and to give you an opportunity to ask questions and raise concerns if you want to. So please do um, interact and, and make the session as useful as, as it can be for you and your teams. So I just wanted to start by talking a little bit about the um, walk around, the infection prevention and control walk around that happened last Friday. And I wanted to thank, I'm not sure if any of you uh, on the call were involved, but there were a large number of people that were involved. And I wanted to say thank you to all of those individuals for being engaged. Um, I think was also involved in the walk around and went to Austin House. We had a checklist of infection prevention control standards and went and, and spoke to people about how they were doing against those standards. And it was really, really positive. Lots of uh, people who put in place lots of safety measures to make sure that your staff and colleagues and patients and families are safe. So really, really impressed with the work you're doing. So well done for that. There were some few key areas that I'd like to um, raise that were raised on the day in terms of learning. One of them was in relation to equipment. And in some cases, um, people did not having access to the, to the extra equipment that was required in it in order to keep equipment segregated from patients who were COVID positive and those who weren't. Things like patient TVs, laptops was something that was raised. Some of our inpatient units and people working from home. There's a big increase in the amount that we need those. Things like blood pressure cuffs for reusing disposable cuffs and those sorts of things. So really important that you let us know if there's kit you need. Um, it's absolutely important that you are not um, making decisions based on the fact that you can't get hold of kits. So really important you raise that later if you need to in relation to that, but we're already taking some action around that. There was also a couple of places that were the, their restrooms and the places that they had to relax were really small and didn't really allow them to maintain social distancing. So again, we're doing some work to go away to, uh, with those areas and try and improve the situation for them and ensure that their rest areas um, are conducive to them being able to have a decent break alongside being able to social distance at the same time. We also, there are a couple of areas where they haven't quite got into the swing of remembering that we're doing two swabs now, one on admission and then two uh, second swab on the seventh day. And that was really good reminder for people and um, we're rolling that out across all of our areas now. We also talked about places where they've got outbreaks at the moment. It's taking an awful lot of admin resource um, to run all the outbreak panels and do all the contact tracing and the admin that supplies. We talked about providing some support into services where they've got outbreaks at the moment to help them manage some of that uh, demand. We also talked about balancing the risks, the risks of infection, the risks of single sex um, accommodation breaches and the risk of lines of sight and clinical care and trying to balance those risks can be quite difficult for people. It's really important that we don't make blanket rules about what we are doing because we need to use best practice and guidance and we need to adapt that to each individual uh, family and, and person that we're looking after make sure that the things we do are really based on what's right for that person at the time. So some really good learning for us, some really good practice and some things to learn from. Um, and if you want to ask any questions later about the walk around, we will be sharing all of the learning that's come out, um, hopefully today or tomorrow. Thank you. 
Next slide. So um, you probably all know uh, most of these numbers. They're, they're regularly shared um, through the media as well. But at the moment, the UK, the national UK picture is that it's 1.1 to 1.3 on the R rate. And as you'll all probably remember, we're trying to get below the one rate um, for us to feel that we've got uh, the ability in the NHS to, to manage the demand. The rate means on average that every 10 people infected will be between every 10 people infected will infect between 11 and 13 other people. So that's how they calculate that rate. And the number of infections is growing by two to two and four percent every day. So an upward trend, and that's the same for Hampshire too. Obviously, you'll know in the news that there are some areas across the country that are significantly higher than that. But at the moment, we've got a rise of 1,714 cases in the last seven days in Hampshire. And um, sadly, there's been eight COVID deaths in the last seven days. So absolutely still um, moving towards uh, the peak of our second phase of COVID-19. This one's for you, I think, Paula. Yeah, it is. Sorry, I was trying to come off mute uh, unprofessionally. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so I'll update you quickly on the position within Southern. Um, as you would expect, we've sort of got the instant command centre uh, up at full strength um, as we see our cases increasing and uh, the number of things that we're needing to try and do as teams increasing. We currently have 35 COVID positive patients and they are split across both physical health and mental health. Um, we've got 77 staff who are currently self-isolating and 20%, 20 staff who are off sick. Um, we are under pressure in some areas. The southeast is feeling under a lot of pressure at the moment, um, partly because the uh, impact within the acute. So I think from memory this morning, there were 140 people, I think, in the acute unit who were COVID positive, um, some of whom need to be moved out of the acute centre, preferably, and, and into other facilities. So um, the teams in the southeast are coping really well, but they are under pressure. Interestingly, very dissimilar to last time, where actually at the moment we have no COVID positive patients in Lymington, which um, from those of you that remember the last outbreak, probably 50% were normally in Lymington. And that's not a deliberate, that is just the way that it's working in that system at the moment in terms of where their COVID positive patients are going. Uh, if they need rehab in our facilities and they're COVID positive, they will be coming our way. Um, so um, it is increasing um, and we've seen that over the last three weeks or so. Um, I think Paul has covered off the uh, making sure people are wearing correct PPE. Um, I, did we want to talk about the visitors and leave situation? Um, I know if Carl was here, he would absolutely have talked about it, but somebody well rehearsed in that that can talk it through. I know we've issued guidance. We have, and again, you know, we're, we're very much trying not to have blanket restrictions in terms of this. Obviously, we are needing to be very mindful, particularly in areas where we have outbreaks. Um, but we're trying to make decisions based on the needs of individual patients as and when they arise. And if people have got questions that they want to ask in the questions section, happy to do that. We can also share the guidance, the most um, recent guidance that has gone out, which is um, at the moment that obviously with discussion with family and carers, depending on the situation, um, we are trying to restrict leave and visiting to reduce the risk of the spread of infection and reduce the number of people as well so that it's only one person that's visiting rather than um, having lots of different people um, coming in and out of the ward areas and obviously increasing the risk. But that's very much down to personal situations and in situations of end of life care, we've absolutely changed some of that guidance to meet people's individual needs. Thanks, Paula. Should we go over to Heather, who will update us around the vaccine arrangements? Thank you. Um, so as this has been um, hitting the national headlines, then I think um, you'll probably all be familiar with the fact that 
there are a number of vaccines which are going through clinical trials at the moment um, and looking to achieve um, licensing here in the UK. Um, and what we know is that there are a number of that which are approaching, you know, close to licensing. So the NHS across the country is being asked to prepare itself for mobilising um, clinical vaccinations around the COVID-19. Um, and the date that we're being given that we need to be ready from is the 1st of December. But whether or not we actually achieve delivery of vaccines for the 1st of December will very much be dependent on the ability of the country to be able to safely license those products. And we definitely will not be rolling out um, any vaccinations until they're licensed as safe for delivery. Um, we're, in terms of our preparation, we're working closely internally. We've got a working group established and we're working closely with our partners across the Hampshire and Isle of Wight system and with primary care. Um, the expectation is that the ask for us will definitely be around the vaccination of our staff um, and to support primary care around housebound patients, um, around the priority cohorts. It's unknown yet what level of support we'd be asked to deliver for the wider population, but certainly the focus will be on our staff and um, supporting primary care around the housebound in the first instance. We're looking at how we deliver the vaccine. And again, you may have heard through the national media, it's a little bit different to the flu vaccine, predominantly in terms of the length of time it can be stored. So it needs a very low level of um, refrigeration. And some of the vaccines can only be stored in a normal fridge for a short period of time. And for the vaccine that we're likely to get first, that's a period of five days. So we're looking at um, potentially using larger sites as hubs for the delivery of the vaccine. Our working group is looking at some of the issues around that, including storage, making sure we've got fridge capacity, and we'll be working through staffing models. So we'll have seen in the comms that we're likely to need some additional support around staffing. Um, and in due course, when we understand the staffing models that we're likely to have and some of the workforce gaps, we'll be starting to, to collate lists. There will be training needed, obviously, in this um, new vaccine. Um, that training programme, again, is likely to be rolled out nationally, but implemented locally. And we'll find out more about that from the national team in due course. Priority groups, we've been given an indication of priority groups and those have been shared. So I've talked about um, uh, NHS staff, the over 80s, care home residents, etc., likely to be in that first group. But the JCVI will advise on the priority groups um, once a licensing has become clear and as I've said we'll be working closely with our system partners most importantly with primary care around the vaccination program but we will find out more in due course and we'll share the information as soon as facts and dates for the rollout become more sure nationally. Thanks Heather. Um, so I'm going to brief really quickly on staff testing. Um, so sorry, uh, just you do. There's been a oh hang on, have I gone into? Oh, yeah, no. sorry. Yeah there's, yeah, there's a question gone in from Donna um, about will corporate staff be offered the vaccine as well? So that remains to be seen. The guidance um, in terms of the first priority is really focused on sort of front line staff. Um, um, so it's unclear yet whether corporate staff will be offered the vaccine in the first wave as well as the frontline staff. So I think we'll have to advise on that in due course. Um, mm. Obviously, frontline staff who are in the, uh, you know, the waves of national prioritisation, sorry, corporate staff who are in the waves of national prioritisation would fall into that category. But we'll, um, we'll find out more on what the steer is for corporate staff. Thanks, Heather. Um, a quick update on staff testing, which is um, relatively recent. Um, so the, the, some of the comms on this came out last week nationally. Um, they've been developing a variety of testing methodologies to how would you get to the point where you can test your staff regularly and not necessarily based on symptoms. Um, and they have reached um, a position where they have availability of lateral flow tests, which 
I, I don't think they'll feel like pregnancy tests, but they're a bit similar as in you can get a test within, um, uh, you can administer it yourself and you get a result within 30 minutes. So we are expecting within the next week to be delivered uh, a vast quantity of these tests for our frontline staff to use on a regular basis at home. Um, the expectation is that they'll come in a box of 25 tests and each relevant staff member will be given uh, a box to take home and do the tests every couple of, well, twice a week based on their own shift pattern. And the point of them is to try and identify staff members who might um, be COVID positive but have not got symptoms. Um, so if you've got symptoms, you do what we do now and what we currently do, and there's no change. But these tests might identify the people that are um, without symptoms. It's being tested by 34 pilot sites. Our local one um, is UHS, so the hospital in Southampton is testing. Um, I think they only received theirs yesterday or the day before, so only very recently. Um, we are trying to get ready just in case they do arrive by Monday so that we are ready to roll out next week. Um, and we're notifying the divisions via the normal routes. Um, staff comms is going out. At the moment, we've just been clear that we know about it. The next comms that will go out probably from Fiona very, very soon is to, tell, is to tell people how they can order them so that they can get them to their, um, their own sites. We're gonna do that through Claire's uh, who are currently uh, distributing all of our PPE and that's worked really successfully so actually Claire's will deliver these for us there, but there is going to be an admin requirement around knowing who's received a box of tests which staff members and also staff members being able to notify us of positive negative or not clear test results so for every staff member that has one that's twice a week they've got to be able to notify us of um, of how that test result has played out so there's quite a recording requirement which we will need to gather together and then pull up the line um, so i'm just we're just working with a few people at the moment to work out how to do that well and as soon as we know how to do that well we'll get information out there's quite a lot of material around um, uh, there's a training video, uh, there's an information leaflet, um, all of those things we'll make available to people as soon as possible so that people can see what it looks like and have a sense of how it feels. Um, we're also being encouraged that if staff, the first time they take a test, some staff may want support with that. Um, and therefore we're being encouraged to make sure that locally there's somebody available that can do that and support staff members on their first test if they need it and their second test to be honest if they still need it. Um, we would plan for this to be used mainly by staff who are going into sites where patients are. So we're being as broad as possible in terms of all of the people in that building, whether that's bank and agency staff, whether it's estates, Medirest, it's, it doesn't matter who it is. We will try and make sure we've got enough tests for everybody. It is about staff that are physically going into buildings where patients are so that we're reducing the risk. Obviously, if, if you're mainly at home, it's very much less risky. The risk of you giving uh, COVID-19 to colleagues is, is massively reduced. And, and the risk of your exposure as well, if you're not actually out, out of the home working quite a lot. So that's where we are at the moment. Literally the first national call on this was last Friday. So apologies, that it's still slightly vague, um, but we will try and keep you updated via comms as soon as we know more or we've got more arrangements in place that are um, sensible and practical is what we're aiming for. Brilliant. Thanks, Paula. Sure. Um, okay, we come to the question bit. Has and, and, and never has been really shy, apart from Donna, who's asked a good question. Um, has anybody else got any questions that they'd like to ask, either specifically about what's been said, or or more broadly about COVID, or about what's happening in the trust? Very happy to take any questions. And I'll hand it over to colleagues. Obviously, I won't answer them myself. But um, no, joking. Just and any questions. Any plans for redeployment of staff, Dean has asked. And is, is that in the line, Dean, is that particularly about the COVID vaccination programme or in general? Oh, I haven't thought of those two aspects, Heather. So uh, 
Take your pick. Nice one, Dean. I mean, at the moment, I think where we can, we're looking to see if we can redeploy. But at the moment, the, the challenges we, we have, I think, is clearly we, we, we're trying to maintain the services that we, we've we got. Um, unlike last time where um, it, we were very much going into the unknown, I think there is a there's a, a clear steer that we need to try and maintain um, all of the services the best we can as we go through um, the, this wave of COVID. Uh, and clearly we've seen in trust up in uh, Manchester, for example, where they've had to close some of their services down or their non sort of urgent services to cope with um, the, the surge that they've had up in Manchester, but clearly they're ahead of us in terms of, of, of their, their numbers um, and also their sickness levels. We're hearing, I was hearing last week, you know, their, their sickness levels are up in sort of 16, 17%. Um, as well so you know which has clearly an impact on our ability to to staff the urgent areas but at the moment we, where we can we are looking so you know if we are I've closed down some of the aspects of lead for example then we're looking to see if we can redeploy staff but at the moment um, generally no we're not but we we will hold back and reserve the that we we're not going to say no no we're not going to because I think we need to reserve that in case um, the, the, the situation warrants is requiring us to to, to move more um, to move people, you know, in, into other areas. Does that answer the question, Dean? I don't know whether colleagues want to add anything. Yeah, and I think um, obviously there's there's huge piece of work around the COVID vaccination program, and time will tell. But uh, you know, I think it's too early to sort of answer that question. We'll be we're at the moment we're asking for some specific people to help support on the, the project management, and then they're being sort of targeted and identified and asked to do that, you know, where necessary. Um, it probably you know, will depend on how quickly nationally the vaccination rollout needs to happen and what some of the national direction is. But again, it's, it's too early to tell. But I think at this stage, we're not anticipating redeployment because the drive is to sustain as much service as possible. Thanks, Heather. Any other questions? Paula Hall's got away quite lightly, I thought. Um, so you might... <laughs> Difficult one for Paula. Anyone? Um, <laughs> sorry, Paula, I'm only teasing. I've any, got any... Jackie here to support oh. me, anyway, Paul. So any difficult ones will go to Jackie. <laughs> Quite of course. Right, yeah. <laughs> any any other questions before we uh, before we I hand over to Paula to wrap up? Oh, here we go. Um, Alison, nationally, uh, are armed forces clinical staff going to be pulled in to provide support? Does anybody, I've not heard anything, does anybody um, know any, any, any other intelligence? I, I did hear that also the COVID vaccine trials. Yeah, I think they are around the COVID vaccination programme. So I think there's, um, there's a sort of a workforce um, branch looking at what additional resource they could draft in nationally. And I think that's an area where they are looking at that. Also, um, you know, the Red Cross services and other kind of voluntary um, services on what training and development you might need. Certainly in terms of vaccine delivery, et cetera, I would imagine they'd be looking to, um, to yeah, armed forces to, to support with that. So, so I think the answer is yes, but um, at this stage, the Hampshire and Isle of Wight um, system have got a, a workforce group who are linked in with the national team on that to understand what kind of national deployment resources might be coming to our area. So, um, so we're connected into that program of work. Fabulous, thank you. Um, so, so it's a yes and no, not not for necessarily mainstream services, but certainly for for some of the support. Um, okay, and then we've got another question from Dean around: um, Do we anticipate any restrictions on leave over the Christmas period? Certainly, we we're not talking about that yet. I think we'll we'll need to take a a, a bit of a rain check. Clearly. Um, We'll, we'll need to see a little bit nearer the date, but at the moment, um, things aren't in that, that place where we would we would uh, anticipate cancelling leave. Um, and then Amy, uh, blah, 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 blah. are you all as are you all as directors as it must? How are you all as directors? It must be demanding and tough, uh, as it is the frontline staff, of course, but in a different way. We really appreciate your support. Thank you, Amy. That's very kind of you. It, it's um, like I say, it's tough for everyone. So for everyone at the moment with um with many things um yeah happening and um but that's very kind of you and we appreciate everyone's support at the moment across the uh, across our, our our services 
um, and across our communities, it, it, it's, a, it's really tough for all, but people are doing an incredible job and it is very, very much appreciated. But thank you for that. I don't know if the colleagues want to uh, say anything before I hand back over to Paula. Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, like, like Paul says, the workload is tough. We're all, um, we're all juggling balls at the moment. I'm just glad you didn't ask me that question last week when we were getting on top of the IMS programme. <laughs> Brilliant. I'll hand you back over to Paula. Yeah, that's a perfect segue, actually, into the last slide, which I found really um, looking on Twitter and we, we tend to talk about the science and we tend to talk about the facts and the numbers um, and of course they're all really important particularly at, at this time but for me there's, there's only one thing that's going to get us through this safely and that is some of the things that are described on this slide growing in strength through connections and I think it's really easy at a time like this fall out with people, to become tense, to be worried, to be anxious. And with everything that's going on, that's quite natural and quite normal that we're all in a heightened state of anxiety with our own families, uh, etc. And now is the time to really connect with some of those really important um, things like kindness, humility, fairness in our actions. Um, so I just really wanted to leave you all with that um, as a reminder that it, it's important that we support each other as human beings through this difficult time and that we draw on some of those softer, quieter elements of our leadership approaches that will help us to really get through this a difficult time. And I just also want to end by saying thank you because we're on 63.6% flu immunization completion, which is pretty damn amazing. And it is going up by the day. So thank you for the really, really um, hard work, great energy, um, because keeping people safe through the flu vaccine is really, really important. And um, particularly as we've got COVID vaccine coming, the sooner that we can get people covered, the better. Uh, one of our divisions is over 74%. So it's truly, truly amazing. Three things to leave you with. Social distancing is truly very important to keep you safe and your patients safe. Hand hygiene is equally important and your masks, your PPE. And be, be careful about your PPE, your social distancing and your hand hygiene, and that will keep you safe. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.